This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israel is intensifying its bombardment of the Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza, destroying dozens of residential buildings and heavy airstrikes overnight, and pushing residents to flee to other parts of the city. This comes as Israel is vowing to escalate its ground attack in the southernmost city of Rafah, with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant saying Thursday additional troops would enter Rafah and that military operations will intensify in the city. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also said Thursday, quote, the battle in Rafah is critical, unquote. 1.4 million Palestinians, over half of Gaza's population, had been displaced to Rafah, seeking shelter. Now more than 600,000 have fled Rafah over the past week and a half since Israel launched its ground offensive there. Since then, no food, fuel or other aid has entered the two main border crossings in southern Gaza, further exacerbating the humanitarian crisis. Some 1.1 million Palestinians are on the brink of starvation, according According to the UN, while a full blown famine is taking place in the North, this confirmed by the World Food Program. The developments come as the International Court of Justice has wrapped up two days of hearings in The Hague after South Africa's request last week for emergency measures to, assault, to halt Israel's assault on Rafah. It marked the third time the U.N.'s top court held hearings on Gaza since South Africa filed a case in December accusing Israel of committing genocide. On Thursday, South Africa's ambassador to the Netherlands, Vusimuzi Modansela, urged the court to order Israel to totally and unconditionally withdraw from the Gaza Strip. When we last appeared before this court to hold this genocidal process to preserve Palestine and its people, instead, Israel's genocide has continued apace and has just reached a new and horrific stage. Israel has sought to hide its crimes through the weaponization of international humanitarian law. It pretends that the civilians it ruthlessly kills through its 2,000-pound bombs, through its targeted airstrikes, through its artificial intelligence systems, through its executions, are human shields. This whitewashing of Israel's genocide misses the key and fundamental element, that of the massive and still mounting evidence of Israel's genocidal intent. Israel presented its defense at the World Court today and denied its carrying out a genocide in Gaza. This is the head of the Israeli delegation to the court, Gilad Noam. South Africa presents the court yet again for the first time within the scope of less than five months, with a picture that is completely divorced from the facts and circumstances. Israel is engaged in a difficult and tragic armed conflict. South Africa ignores this factual context, which is essential in order to comprehend the situation, and also ignores the applicable legal framework of international humanitarian law. It makes a mockery of the heinous charge of genocide. The International Court of Justice today ordered representatives for Israel to submit more information about humanitarian conditions in its so-called evacuation zones in Gaza. This comes as foreign ministers from 13 countries have signed on to a letter warning Israel to halt its ground operations in Rafah and to get more aid to Palestinians, the letter signed by all G7 members, minus the United States. For more, we're joined by longtime Israeli journalist Amira Haas. Born in 1956 in Jerusalem, her parents Holocaust survivors, she's the Haaretz correspondent for the occupied Palestinian territories, based in Ramallah. She's the only Israeli Jewish journalist to have spent 30 years living in and reporting from Gaza and the West Bank. Her books include Drinking the Sea at Gaza, Days and Nights in a Land Under Siege. 
Amira Haas is the recipient of the 2024 Columbia Journalism Award, and on Wednesday, she addressed the graduating class of the Columbia Journalism School here in New York. She now joins us in our New York studio. Amira, welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. Congratulations <clears throat> on your award, but more importantly, on your reporting. Um, you are so unusual in Israel as the only Israeli Jewish journalist to live in the occupied territories for the last 30 years. Um, as you gave your address to the Columbia Journalism School, a number of its students threatened by New York police to even step outside the school when they were trying to cover the Gaza Solidarity encampment outside as police moved in. And ultimately, I think the number of arrests on campus numbered more than 200. Um, can you talk about the coming together of the issues that you cover and um, what you feel it's so important that journalists uh, should understand about their role in society? Um, as I said in my address to the students, uh, it is, if I want to sum it up, not in a professional way or, or, or uh, uh, like a, a teacher-like way, is to resist the normalization of evil and of, uh, of injustice. Because we are so used to so much, there is so much injustice in this world, not in e everywhere. And we have to use our, uh, the, the unwritten social contract between us and citizens uh, the world over to scrutinize, to monitor, to challenge power, uh, centers of power, the abusive power. Any power is can be abusive or is abusive. Only uh, we we have the power to tr at least try and restrain it. I think this is this is this should be the the role, not the only role, but this should be a main role of of journalists to restrain power wherever it is being uh, 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 manifested. Ever the journalist in your. Uh J School address, you quoted a friend in Gaza. And this is particularly important as yeah. uh, what happened just feet um, from where the school is. If you can tell us who he is yeah. and what he said. Yeah. Um, just a few, a few, uh, um, uh, two weeks before the address, I received a WhatsApp from a friend called Bassam Nasser. I met him in the early 90s when he was still a student. And uh, we haven't been in touch for many years. He is a father of four. He is uh, heading an aid, uh, aid institution or center in Gaza. He was uh, displaced, like so many others, from Gaza to, the, to Rafah to save his life. His house, I know, is in ruins now in Gaza. And now he had to flee again with his family from, and the institution from, from Rafah to Dir el Bala in the center. And he sent me a very, uh, he from time to time writes something on WhatsApp in English, and I guess he shares it with some others. Uh, and he shares his thoughts and feelings. And he shared with me uh, something concerning the um, demonstrations and protests in American, in American uh, campuses. And I thought, of course, fit to bring it to the, to read it, uh, so I can read it now. Um, sorry. So, and this is from, from the talk and what I, uh, the quote that I brought to the, on, on Wednesday to the students. A glimmer of hope emerges from university students demonstrating the enduring presence of humanity. Panicked, hypocritical politicians swiftly resort to force in order to quell the movement, fearing its global expansion. Repression is enacted to stifle voices challenging the status quo. Police and National Guards are deployed, arresting students who were expelled just hours earlier for speaking out against the violence in Palestine. From Gaza to New York and other major cities worldwide, I want to express deep gratitude for these voices. While you may not be able to save every child in Gaza or restore our shattered lives and dreams,
and your efforts won't prevent the next devastating airstrike that will wipe out our entire family. On behalf of every Palestinian, I want to express heartfelt appreciation for raising awareness to our plight. And I know he's not the only one. I mean, I know that if there was some kind of a, really a ray of hope in people's life, in, in people's health, not life, in the, last, in the last month, are those demonstrations and protests. Now, I wanted to go to someone else talking about those protests. You gave your graduation address on Wednesday at the Columbia Journalism School. Um, the president, um, Manu Shafiq, had canceled the main graduation ceremony because of the protests. But yesterday, faculty, to say the least, completely exhausted, um, organized a people's graduation. Um, Columbia students and faculty celebrated an alternative people's graduation as they gathered for a ceremony just nearby at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, with many students wearing their blue graduation gowns. On the stage with the professors was the Reverend Herbert Daughtry, the New York civil rights leader who was an early mentor to now Mayor Eric Adams, whose claim the protests at Columbia were, quote, co-opted by professional outside agitators. But among the speakers who addressed the students was the poet Fadi Judah, who read his poem dedication about Palestinians killed by Israel, the Palestinian-American lawyer and human rights activist Noura Arakat, and the award-winning journalist Mona Chalabi, who has rejected her 2023 Pulitzer Prize uh, and has been highly critical of Gaza coverage by mainstream U.S. media outlets. In her address, she paid tribute to the student journalists in the audience who covered the Gaza encampment, often while facing arrests themselves. Hi, Havivis. I'm just going to talk to you for two minutes, because I have the huge honour of acknowledging my fellow journalists in the room. So, as many of you know, our institutions have failed us these past seven months and long before that. Writers and editors at some of the most respected newsrooms have told lies about what is happening in Gaza. They have said that death threats falling from the skies are evacuation orders. They have described forced displacement as migration. They have issued warnings to their staff, telling them not to use words like ethnic cleansing or genocide. In short, they've used their reporting to minimize the suffering in Gaza and maintain the status quo. And they've had that reporting honored by the Pulitzers. <laughs> they've even sought to... <laughs> they've even sought to discredit or ignore Palestinian journalists like Hind, who face death every day. So I shouldn't have been surprised when I heard what happened last month. A reporter at the New York Times was told that something seemed to be happening at Columbia University. Students appeared to have claimed a lawn as theirs. So like any breaking news story, a Slack channel had been created for the journalists to discuss details and assign stories. This is what they do at the New York Times. When this reporter joined the Slack channel, they were surprised to find that it had been titled Anti-Semitism on Campus. They had decided what the story was before they even took a train uptown. Meanwhile, journalists on campus have had a very different perspective. You had begun reporting before a single tent was assembled. You have not only witnessed the encampments, you listened to the chants, you read the signs, and you spoke to the organizers. You did the work, and you did it so well that journalists like me off campus turn to your words, your Instagram accounts, and we listen to your radio stations if we wanted the truth. assaulted and arrested you and your fellow students. And you did it all while trying to graduate and to grieve. That is true for anti-Zionist Jewish students who are having their faith questioned by those who want them to fall silent. It's true for students whose parents look like the mothers and fathers being killed every day. And it is especially true for the Palestinian students who continue to report the facts while navigating unbearable grief. I am so proud to call you my colleagues. Would the journalists in the room please stand? <laughs> that's, that's the award-winning journalist Mona Shalabi, who just won the 2023 Pulitzer Prize 
though she rejected it. At the awards ceremony, Mona called out fellow journalists for their unwillingness to say the word Palestine. She donated her $15,000 prize money to the Palestinian Journalist Syndicate to help fight what she talked about as the asymmetry of information that elevates Israeli voices over Palestinian ones in the mainstream media. Uh, she was addressing the people's graduation yesterday uh, at St. John the Divine for the Columbia and Barnard students. Amira Haas, as you listen to Mona, and uh, you think about also the Palestinian journalists who have died in Gaza, the astounding number of journalists who have died. Who have been killed. Who have been killed. Yeah. Talk about that, then. And do you feel that they were directly targeted, so often wearing uh, yeah. the press vest yeah. and the helmets? I remember one Palestinian journalist, as he heard about his dear friend just having been killed, ripped off his press and helmet and said, why yeah. are we wearing these? They just make us a target. Yeah. I guess, you know, one part in me wants to, to, to think that this is not true. I mean, that they were killed because they are in, a pla in places which are dangerous and because they uh, uh, circulate a lot. I mean, move around in, a, in times when people try not to move around. Um, I think there is a, what we call a finger, I think a fingerprint uh, a targeting or profiling, because anybody who uses a, dro a, 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 a drone even for, for filming, uh, for, for photographing, is considered by the uh, uh, people with the, behind the Israeli assaulting drones or predator drones as somebody who is, who is part of, of, of the uh, fighting units. So they kill them automatically without checking if they are only taking photos. So I think there is a variety of, of, of excuses or, or explanation that Israel, Israel would give. <coughs> but certainly, um, in some cases, they were, they were connecting journalists to the 7th of October or to uh, 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 other activities completely not, not as, as journalists and wanten, wanting to take revenge of them. But this has to be checked, and I think it is being checked by, by several venues, uh, each one case. But certainly when there are so many people, so many journalists killed, it shows that there is a pattern. Uh, uh, and, and our role is to discover the pattern. But there are patterns of ma other things. There are patterns of, uh, of whole families who are being killed. So 40, 30, 35. So you can say that you, you are targeting one, one of the family, which means that you allow the killing of, uh, let's say that this one person is very dangerous to the security of Israel, then it means that you allow yourself to kill 30 people, 40 people, 25 people, including children, including babies, for one person. So this is a pattern. We can learn about it from, from, the, from the reality. No, we don't need to, to, to have secret documents for it. But, but it was so. It was the, there is a very important investigation by, by Yuval Avraham of, of uh, uh, Sihamik of uh, 972, who did talk to intelligence, uh, soldiers in the intelligence, and proof that there is an Israeli OK to to kill so and so many for one person. And we interviewed Yuval yeah. um, on Democracy Now!, talking about the AI programs Lavender yes. and yeah. Where's Daddy. Yeah. Um, so you have the killing of journalists and then the banning of journalists. And I wanted to go for a moment. I think it was two days after World Press Freedom Day that Israel banned Al Jazeera inside Israel. the country. Police officers raiding the network's Jerusalem bureau, seizing broadcast equipment. Over the past seven months, Al Jazeera, one of the only international outlets with reporters on the ground inside Gaza, a few of whom were killed. This is a pre-recorded video message by Al Jazeera's Imran Khan from East Jerusalem. 
If you're watching this pre-recorded report, then Al Jazeera has been banned in the territory of Israel. On April the 1st, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, passed a law that allowed the prime minister to ban Al Jazeera. He's now enacted that law. Let me just take you through some of the definitions within the law. They've banned our website, including anything that has the option of entering or accessing the website, even passwords that are needed, um, whether they're paid or not, and whether it's stored on Israeli servers or outside of Israel. The website is now inaccessible. Uh, they're also banning any device pr used for providing content. That includes my mobile phone. If I use that uh, to do any kind of news gathering, then the Israelis can simply confiscate it. Our internet access provider, the guy that simply hosts uh, Al Jazeera.net, uh, is also in danger of being fined if they host the website. The Al Jazeera TV channel, completely banned. Transmission by any kind of content provider is also banned. And holding offices or operating them in the territory of Israel by the channel. Also, once again, any devices used to provide content for the channel can be taken away by the Israelis. It's a wide-ranging ban. We don't know how long it will be in place for, but it does cover this territory of the state of Israel. Imran Khan, Al Jazeera. Occupied East Jerusalem. And that was his last report um, from Occupied East Jerusalem. Now, Al Jazeera reporters say when they're reporting from, for example, Amman, we are banned from Israel. But interestingly, Amira Haas, you don't have the same thing happening with CNN and MSNBC. No, they're not banned from reporting in Israel. But they are not allowed by Israel to go into Gaza. And each time they have a report outside of Gaza, they don't say, and we want to remind you, we are not on the ground in Gaza because the Israeli government yeah. has prevented that. I cannot <clears throat> I don't watch them when I'm in Ramallah or uh, but I want to say that when it comes to the Israeli public, it doesn't matter if the if the Al Jazeera are inside Israel or not inside Israel. The general Israeli public does not want to know about what's happening in Gaza, and the Israeli media does not show anything. I mean, they show very, very, very uh, uh, a few images of the destruction. They give very little information and footage of the of the death of the uh, wounded people. I mean. Uh, uh, there is no relation between what 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 is happening and what is shown on Al Jazeera and what the Israeli media shows but it is not it is not a dictate from above it is not a, a it is not state censorship unlike with with Al Jazeera it is a decision of most of the Israeli venues most of the Israeli media venues uh, especially the TV of course not to show those horrible scenes that might give some sense to some Israelis that this is not for morally, but this is logically cannot cannot produce uh, a, 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 cannot produce a, a change in Palestinian attitudes or a change for accepting Israel or accepting Israeli rights to exist, etc., etc. If for eight months it launches such a such a such a an onslaught of revenge and uh, supremacy against them. Uh, but the Israeli public is not looking for it, is not searching for it in general. I mean, of course, there are, there are, uh, 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 there are exceptions, like the Israeli left-wing, Israeli activists, Israeli uh, uh, um, human rights activists, political leftist activists. Of course, they, there are exceptions. So it's not the entire society. And of course, there are the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. but. The banning of Al Jazeera is not the reason why Israelis do not see do not see the reality in Gaza, and uh, uh, this is not the reason. This is the choice not to know. Interestingly, hostage families. Um, you don't even see uh, in the U.S. media hostage families saying, end this war. You certainly see them talking about the horror of yeah. their loved ones being held in Gaza. 
But the second part of it, for a number of these hostage mm -hmm. families, yeah. are end the war now. Yeah. Number, not all, but, but number, yes, of course. But this is the American media. I mean, it's not... Uh, we do know that there are families among the hostage, uh, uh, hostage families that, that do speak differently uh, than the uh, choir. I want to ask you about the Nakba about what happened in 1948 and what's happening today uh, when we come back from break. We're speaking with longtime Israeli journalist Amira Haas, uh, Haaretz correspondent for the Occupied Palestinian Territory. She's based in Ramallah, um, and uh, she lived in Gaza for three years, um, wrote a book called Drinking the Sea at Gaza, Days and Nights in a Land Under Siege. She's the only Israeli journalist to have lived in the Occupied Territories for decades. Decades. Stay with us. Composer and pianist V.J. Iyer performing Kite during the People's Graduation Thursday at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. He dedicated the song to the Palestinian writer and poet Rafat el Arir, who was killed in December by an Israeli airstrike, along with his brother, sister, and four of his, um, of, uh, his niece's children. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our conversation with a longtime Israeli journalist Amira Haas, the Haaretz correspondent for the Occupied Palestinian Territories. She's now based in Ramallah, the only Israeli Jewish journalist who have spent 30 years in and reporting from Gaza and the West Bank. Among her books, Drinking the Sea at Gaza, Days and Nights in a Land Under Siege, and editing her mother's memoir from Bergen-Belsen, from the concentration camp. She is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. Um, Talk about what happened 76 years ago this week, May 15th, Amira, and talk about what's happening today. I'll start from this today, because I think that we... Um, <clears throat> look, there, there is a country with two peoples, Palestinians and Jews. And um, we, can, we can have a long discussion, histori historiographical di di discussion and debate about how it came about that there are two peoples in this country. And why, in, 40, in 1948, uh, uh, there was a state for Jews established, while the UN resolution about a, a state for Palestinians, Arabs as they were called, was not established. It doesn't change the fact that there are two peoples. And it doesn't change the fact that people want to live in their homeland. It doesn't change the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of refugees, Palestinian refugees, who were, uh, or Palesti hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who were chased out of the country of their homeland in 1948, and that by now, with their uh, 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 children and grandchildren, there are uh, several millions, and they see this country as their country, as their homeland. And it doesn't change the fact that there are Israeli Jews who see Israel and the country as their country. And there is a decision ha that has to be made. Do they want to live? Do they want their grandchildren to live and live well in that country, in justice, 
or do they want to uh, send their grandchildren and children uh, for wars forever uh, that will force some people who have the money, who have the talents, who have the contacts to emigrate and for others to remain and to live in, 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 in destitute uh, and in hunger and in uh, ignorance for the rest of their lives and their, I don't know, for the end of the generations or until the, the world expires. So this is, the, this is why we, can, we, we feel that we still live the Nakba and the outcomes of the Nakba, because the Nakba there is no Arabic for catastrophe. For catastrophe because there is no uh, no acknowledgement that you cannot live in this in this unbearable injustice that one people has the rights and one people controls and dictates the life of the other people in the in the land. The thing is that we have to acknowledge there are two peoples in the land, and peoples have rights. And right now, we deprive the Palestinians of their very ba basic rights. Not only the basic right for, of, of life, as we see going on in Gaza right now, but on the normal days of occupation. We deprive them of water, freedom of movement, land, housing rights, planning, uh, uh, travel, living with their families, uh, choosing their uh, university, uh, developing their, uh, their uh, economy, uh, uh, prospering, investing, all these things. We, we, at any moment, Israeli soldiers can confiscate millions of dollars from Palestinians for one pretext or another. Uh, Israeli settlers uh, 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 carry out Israeli policies, but in much more uh, zeal in, uh, and, and, and confiscate land, take over land. I mean, people, Palestinians' life is never, they are never safe. They never live in security for more than, well, more than 75 years uh, in, both par in both sides of the Green Line, both in Israel and the, and the territory occupied in 67. So there has to be a decision by Israeli people. Do we want to live for, we came, Israel was established for, so that Jews will feel secure and live normally. This is not normal life. They pretended that this is normal life, that we can occupy another people and feel normal. No, and the 7th of October, with all the atrocities and the, and the, and the, and the enormous suffering that was, in, was, was that the families and the, and, the, and the casualties and the victims of 7th of October uh, uh, are living through all this, this, this suffering and the really trauma, terrible trauma and, 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 and uh, uh, cruelty, but this is this was a kind of a of a, a a very expected answer by Hamas and by Palestinians to years long atrocities perpetuated by 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 Israel and uh, and perpetrated by Israel and uh, the main thing is the refusal refusal to accept and to acknowledge the national rights of Palestinians for statehood. They were ready for it in the 90s. I know, I know that Israelis tried to switch everything around and say that they, were, they sabotaged the Oslo Agreement. Not correct. And this is one of the things that I followed very closely, how Israel did everything from the beginning, under the guise of a peace process, did everything possible to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian side a, alongside Israel. and. Uh, 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 there is a, there is a, uh, you know, we uh, we go back all the time to this because all the time Israelis say that it's the opposite, but they completely avoid all the all the uh, 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 all the all the evidence. So Israel did what Israel did during the last 30 years is to prove to the world and to the Palestinians that the Palestinians were right from the beginning of, of, of the 30s on the 40s when they said that Israel is a colonial entity or a settler colonial entity. Israel had a chance <coughs> in 1993 to stop its co settler colonial activity in the West Bank and Gaza and to say, OK, we don't go back to 48. Let's start for now and build a different, a new phase a new historical phase, it did the opposite. It 
uh, uh, continued with its bans on Palestinian construction, on Palestinian development. It disconnected Palestinians from each other, disconnected Gaza from the West Bank, started to, 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 to fragment more and more the, the West Bank by, by, by roads that are meant only for Jews. Uh, and this is in the 90s. This is in the 90s. Rabin said himself he did not want, he w was not opting for a state. So this is the question of Israeli settler colonialism. It's Israel that proved that it's settler colonial. And we live with it now with the, all ab this abnormalcy that Israeli Jews wanted to live normally, happily, you go to Tel Aviv, you think you are in New York or you, in, you are in London, and 40, 50 kilometers away, Palestinians live in, ca in cages, in cages disconnected from each other, and everything is dictated by Israel. The quantity of water in my place, in my home, in, 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 in El Bire, in summer we have uh, 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 the, the, the water quantities are rationed because there is not enough water. But when you go to a nearby settlement, it's lush, it's green, in, 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 so much water they have. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Israeli, Israeli ranchers take over by violence take over uh, hundreds of thousands of, of or, or tens of thousands of uh, dunams, something that built settlements were not, did, could not do. And they do it by violence and by the assistance and, uh, 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 and silence or, or indifference or encouragement of the Israeli authorities. The police, the army, the, the, the prosecution, everybody. So this is when Palestinians say that the Nakba is ongoing, they don't only mean uh, they mean Gaza, of course. This is, and in, for many people, as I know, they feel that the, the, what's the, 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 the carnage in, 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 in Gaza now is much worse than they experienced in uh, 1948. But it's also the, 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 the um, Israel took the Palestinian life and, and liberty and freedom as hostage for the past 70 years, 75 years, all over in many forms. Inside Israel, Palestinians are, do not dare to speak out because then they will be, if they just say a word, like if they say the word shahid, which is martyr, and they, and they mourn the death of so many Palestinians in Gaza, they might be taken, they might be arrested for, the, for, for, for incitement. So- If they use the word martyr. I, yeah, like in, in on Facebook, I, I don't. In Facebook, you you see that they uh, 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 or martyr or something or something like this. I mean, it's it's just an example of how people are are afraid to use words that are very normal. Even a a, a sentence from the Quran can be taken as a proof that they are that they support Hamas. Um, so. As you talk about Gaza and, and the West Bank, let's talk more about the West Bank. Thousands of people have been arrested. Hundreds have been killed since October 7th. You talk about um, what you call the Smotrich plan, uh, Bezalel Smotrich, now the, uh, uh, the minister of finance uh, since 2022. Yeah, he's, and he's a, a, a minister also in the ministry. Of, uh, of defense, and he's responsible on the settlements, actually, on the development of the settlements of the West Bank. Both he and Ben Gavir are settlers. Uh, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he published in 2017 something called the Decisive Plan, which actually says that the Palestinians have to, uh, uh, um, uh, to accept that they will never have a state. That they will never have, they will never be equal citizens in this country, uh, and they can enjoy their individual rights. If they don't want, they can go, they can emigrate, which is of course the preferable uh, 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 s option for him. And then, if they refuse both, and they resist, I, sometimes he says me uh, uh, violently resist, sometimes he says resist. They will. The army will know, or the security uh, apparatus will know how to to deal with it. And it was in one way or the other interpreted as as okay, they will they will be killed. Uh, he rejected when people people assumed that he meant that civilians will be killed. He rejected this. But anyway, we see now that what is happening is the implementation of the decisive plan. 
but it shows that it's it, all over Palestinians are targeted for any uh, 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 as a message that if you want to live in peace, I mean normally or sem seemingly or quasi normally, you have to be silent. You shouldn't say anything. You certainly should not demonstrate. You certainly shouldn't uh, 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 take arms. You certainly shouldn't uh, 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 convene, uh, uh, do something to, so to show support. Even defend yourself, protect yourself from settlers. Uh, violence uh, can cause you in, uh, in arrest. Uh, so this message, message and I, Smotrich would not have succeeded to such an extent if the state has not prepared the ground and has not really been in the same position for the last 20 years at least. So it's not that Smotrich is such a, such a genius that he can, or so powerful that he can impose his uh, position all, on the rest of the government. In a way he is because, I mean, he knows where, where Netanyahu is vulnerable. Vulnerable. He knows how that how much the, the also the Orthodox Jews want this government to continue. But the fact that in practice all Israeli authorities are part of the repression of the Palestinians in so many ways and in such a way that is so similar to Smotrich's plans shows that it has been in the. Uh, 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 in the DNA of the of the of the system of this deep state uh, for so many years. As we wrap up this discussion, um, where do you see what's happening right now? Just as we sat down, um, the Israel finished its defense for the emergency appeal by South Africa to prevent it from a full-scale ground offensive in Rafah. Israel insisting that aid is coming through with ease at all the entry points, yeah. um, and South Africa saying they must be stopped. Uh, how do you see this ending? Right now, I hope that the judges will move because because the the way that Israel has been able for almost for almost six months to play and to drag it uh, 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 into a, and how the the Western countries allow this to continue without putting leverage that they have on Israel in order to stop the carnage uh, and the famine and the starvation and the deliberate starvation. Uh, our hopes now are with the, the, the judges that they will see that Israel is lying. And what about with the United States? I mean, you have President Biden now um, announcing $1 billion of military weapons in the pipeline for Israel, including $700 million for tank ammunition, $500 million in tactical vehicles, $60 million in mortar rounds. The significance of the, what position the U.S. takes and what Biden is doing. He, he supports Israel in its, to continue the war. I mean, that's that's. I have. I, I see no other. I, I no other explanation to this. I mean, all his words that he's worried about Rafah or Famine or whatever. So uh, I, 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 it's such hypocrisy that I I'm I feel almost speechless. Uh, uh, to you think on the one hand they are sending uh, aid or they say that they are sending aid, but it takes so long and it is so little. And on the other hand, they encourage Israel to continue with the war against Gaza, where we see that already Israel is, is defeated. I mean, it's defeated. If such a, such a huge military power uh, is still fighting Hamas after eight months, uh, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't give anything good to the, to the Israelis. I mean, except of some groups that wanted to, to continue. Five but, seconds. Yeah. But for the majority of Israelis, it's clear that the majority of Israelis understand, even though they support the war on the one hand, they understand it's against them, too. Longtime Israeli journalist and author Amira Haas, Haaretz correspondent for the Occupied Palestinian Territories. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.